and uh, welcome to this first meeting of the committee. It's a very unique committee and the Parliament is supporting it in partnership with Young Women Lead. That's a leadership project that 38 young women from across Scotland are taking part in. Some of them are around the table today and others are with us in the public gallery at the back. I'm really pleased to be welcoming both the committee members and our panellists to this session. And the session will run to approximately 12.25. I also want to welcome those who are watching online and thank you for the interest you're showing. We'll move to the agenda. Agenda item one is to agree that we take items three and four, which is consideration of the evidence we hear today and the future work programme in private. Are we all agreed? Thank you very much. Agenda item two is an evidence session on sexual harassment in schools. This committee met in February and agreed this topic of inquiry. And we're going to look at the issue of sexual harassment in particular as it's faced by girls and young women in schools. I'm very pleased to welcome our witnesses this morning and I will ask them to introduce themselves and where they come from quickly. Starting with you, Catherine. Thank you. Hello. My name is Catherine Dawson. I work for Rape Crisis Scotland. I'm the Sexual Violence Prevention Coordinator there. So my role involves um, the sort of coordination and oversight of a programme which works um, delivering education around consent and healthy relationships in schools, um, delivered by rape crisis centres locally. Um, and also we're developing a whole school approach in, in partnership with Zero Tolerance. And that's about thinking about how schools can take a sort of a, a holistic approach to understand, to sort of preventing gender-based violence and promoting gender equality. Um, so that's me. My name is Amy Johnson. I'm a policy officer with Zero Tolerance. So we work with Rape Crisis Scotland on the whole schools approach. And as an organisation, our focus is primary prevention of violence against women and girls. Hello, I'm Rosanna MacDonald. I'm the Children and Young People's Policy Worker at Scottish Women's Aid. And um, my role involves making sure that policy developments um, relating to children experiencing domestic abuse are appropriate and reflect their lived experiences. And also working to make sure that children and young people who have experienced domestic abuse are able to feed in and engage with policy developments. And uh, thank you very much for inviting me as well to this very special and unique session. I'm very excited to be taking part. Hi there, my name is Mary Gordon. I am from Girl Getting Scotland. I'm the media officer there. Our young members have been spearheading a campaign uh, to, end sexual, to end sexual harassment in schools, calling for a zero tolerance approach, better recording of incidents, and improved uh, high quality sex and relationships education in every Scottish school. Thank you, thank you very much. I'll now open up the session to questions from our members, and I'll begin with a question from our Deputy Convener, Nazia Mahmood. Thank you, Convener. Um, I'd like to open up the discussion by asking our witnesses um, whether they think the term sexual harassment and any associated terms, for example, um, sexist behaviour, if this is widely understood, uh, and if not, um, what might be missing from that common understanding of this issue? Who would like to respond first? Oh, you got them right in the first question there. <laughs> Catherine Dawson. Um, I'm not very good at being quiet for long, so um, I think um, I think my, my broad answer would probably be no. I think there are many, many behaviours that are happening on everyday level that aren't understood as sexual harassment. Um, I've heard it said that what might be recognised as sexual harassment in a workplace setting isn't recognised and validated um, when it's young people, when it's in a, a school setting or, or education setting. So, um, no, I, I think probably we, we lack our universal services, working with young people lack a kind of um, a, a way of understanding and dealing with sexist behaviour and sexual harassment as such, naming it and having consistent ways of, of dealing with it. Amy Johnson. Um, I'd like to add as well, I'd agree with Catherine that it's not widely understood. I think it's normalised, um, both in terms of how perpetrators view it um, and also as, uh, from the perspective of people that have to experience it. But I think something that's also not understood very well is how it interacts and often interacts with racism, homophobia, transphobia and ableism. And there's very little information on that. We're not good at gathering that. And that's something that I think that needs to be taken more seriously as well. 
Yeah, Ros Rosanna McDonald. <laughs> I would completely agree with what Catherine and Amy have been saying. Um, in terms of domestic abuse, I would say that that is a, um, a terminology that conjures up images of a, a family home and people who've maybe been married or in a relationship for a long time. So I think that that is a term that maybe doesn't chime with young people and their own experiences. So it's maybe looking at how we frame that in relation to young people. So sometimes talk about dating abuse instead, which seems to speak a lot more to um, young people. But I think a large part of this involves um, working with young people to come up with um, raising awareness of the, what this terminology means, as they'll have a better idea than adults about how to um, how it would speak to young people of their own age groups. So I think that's also really important. Mary Gordon. Yeah, I'd just like to um, second everything that has been said. In our research in Girls' Attitude Survey, we broke down sexual harassment into different categories to get a real insight into what girls mean when they talk about it. So, for example, we found that in 2017, 41 per cent of girls aged 13 to 21 had experienced jokes or taunts. Um, a similar number had experienced sexist comments on social media, and then about a fifth had experienced things like unwanted touching or groping. So I think it's really helpful to break it down into um, you know, really practical terms so girls can relate to that. Um, a lot of the anecdotal evidence we gathered during our campaign was that often when girls spoke to their peers about sexual harassment, even among girls, it was just dismissed as a bit of banter. Again, when they spoke to boys of a similar age, it was dismissed as a bit of banter or boys will be boys. And probably the most worrying thing was when they spoke to teachers about what they'd experienced. Sometimes they would get the same response, oh, that's just how boys behave. Um, you just have to, you know, not provoke it stay quiet um, so that's something we're really keen to address is at a really early level what do we mean when we talk about sexual harassment and and how can everyone but especially teachers be trained to recognize it and address it effectively would you like to probe any of that Lizia? um i would like to actually ask uh, mary gordon um you were speaking there about how many of the um young women girls um were asked about their experiences was this done over um, a varied age range? Yep. Or, so, or so did, did you find it more so in certain age ranges? Um, I'd need to go back to our full research to find the uh, breakdown into different categories, but the bulk of our research in this area focuses on girls 13 to 21. It's UK-wide research, um, and we interviewed about 1,700 girls for each girl's attitude survey. We've also got a really interesting comparison in how the problem has sadly got worse over the last five years. So we started gathering data in 2014, um, when 59% of girls said they'd experienced some form of sexual harassment, and in 2017, that had increased to 64%. So sadly, um, despite the fact that awareness is being raised around these issues, the experience does seem to be getting worse for a lot of girls. Ellen Soper has a question following on. Hi there. Thank you, convener. Um, I have a question which kind of relates back to what Catherine Dawson was saying in regards of the perception of what sexual harassment is in schools. So I just wondered um, if, well, it's a question really for the whole panel, um, if you think the Scottish Government or other public bodies could be doing more to ensure that girls and young women understand what sorts of actions and behaviours amount to sexual harassment or sexist behaviour. I th oh, Mary Gordon again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, yes, I think that's a big part of our call is looking at how we can uh, improve uh, sex and relationships education. The feedback we had from girls is that in some schools it's really good, in some schools it's quite patchy, and we see that as a really pivotal part of uh, changing girls' experiences while they're at school, but also for the rest of their life. So if we can really get the message out then, it will hopefully mean that they don't have to deal with these experiences during school and in their future lives as well. I think it's also important, as much as we want to make girls aware of what's acceptable, we also need to make sure boys are aware of what's acceptable, and sex and relationships education seems like the ideal opportunity to um, start that message. Yeah. Catherine Dawson? Um, yes, so yeah, I wanted to echo what Mary says about that point about um, uh, yeah, boys and young men understanding. I think that's really, really important. Um, and I think there's perhaps a point to be made about the, um, I think the sort of the policy framework and the guidance that's out there for education 
And I think that there is a kind of a preference to sort of neutralise issues of equality into um, respect and fairness and kind of individual level good, good behaviour. And I think it would help if um, the guidance that was there for all the kind of education services, teacher training, to be clear on the need to actually educate on, on inequality, these different forms of intersecting inequalities and how they work, um, so that we're clear, for example, why it is we're talking about girls and not just young people in, in this respect. So I think that would be helpful as well. Amy Johnson. Yeah, I'd also like to add that I think whilst the, you know, the review of PSE that's going on and religious, uh, sorry, um, I always get RSHPE mixed up. Um, <laughs> so many acronyms. Um, is ongoing. Um, we need to think about the whole, the whole school and how um, the whole curriculum can support this. Because uh, you can have an amazing PSE class that really engages uh, young men and young women and then uh, young people go out to another class where it's undermined or where there's no safe spaces in the school and again what they've learned is immediately undermined um, and I think that approach could also be reflected earlier on um, within possibly the early years as well so the idea of uh, sexual harassment being rooted in gender inequality starts much much earlier it starts from the age of two according to a lot of evidence. So considering how that can be tackled and how, whether it's gender friendly or gender equal um, nurseries or childcare practitioners can, can feed into that and what policy can look around that as well. Would you like to add something? Sure, I mean, I think um, the rest of the panel have, have um, said a lot of what I would um, have said or agreed with um, already, but I think um, in terms of what you're saying about what the Scottish government could do, um, the <coughs> pardon me, equally safe delivery plan was recently published and that does set out a range of quite encouraging actions we're very pleased to see, um, including building the capacity of education professionals to recognise and address harmful gender stereotypes and roles. Um, and you'll probably hear me saying this a lot, so sorry for becoming a stuck record in advance, but I think they could be um, making stronger commitments to working with children and young people to develop those messages and to develop materials and education and awareness raising materials for schools and education. I think Erin uh, Wemble wants to pick up on a theme that was mentioned during that uh, response. Thank you, Convener. Um, following on from what Catherine Dawson said about focusing on young people, do you think in the context of the debate and the discussion it's necessary to focus on, um, you know, focus on girls and boys and women and men instead of focusing on just women and girls? Catherine Dawson. Yeah. Um, I think that... I think I, so. I think that, however you tackle it, you, yes, you need to talk. Yes, I do think we need to talk about, about boys and men and, and people of all genders as well. Um, and I think there's, I suppose, there are kind of intersecting things to talk about. So there's gender and there's age, and there's inequalities associated with all of that. I think when we're talking. Um, about boys and men, then that needs to be about predominantly trying to engage them as allies to work alongside us, understanding that equality, the gender equality and all forms of, of equality are in all of our interests. So there's a trade-off. I think if we tackle gender equality effectively, boys and men will lose some power in relation to girls and women, but I think they'll gain in well-being. Um, and so that's, I suppose that's the way that I would approach it. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Thanks. Rosanna McDonald. Yeah, I think just to add to that, there is um, maybe more conversations to be had about how uh, rigid gender norms and stereotypes harm everyone, not just women and girls. It does, of course, disproportionately impact um, women and girls. But I think we need to be having more conversations about um, the fact that the only emotion that is okay for young men to um, display in public is anger. Um, and I think we need to be having more conversations around that. There seems to be a general agreement there, so uh, perhaps we can move on. Um, it's interesting that the Scottish Parliament actually, uh, one of its committees, a Human Rights and Equalities Committee, um, held an inquiry into a lot of this, and I know that many of you, if not all, will have read some of the evidence on that. I think uh, one of the issues that came up was the lack of, sort of holistic knowledge we have um, about how many instances... Uh, they're having and how they're dealt with. So I know that um, Emily 
Davis would like to explore that theme. harassment in schools in Scotland? Who knows the answer to that one? <laughs> <laughs> Mary Gordon. Off, um, and say that at the moment our knowledge as an organisation comes uh, largely from the Girls' Attitude Survey. Um, it is UK-wide research and I think it would be really valuable to drill down into the experience of Scottish girls and to be able to pull out any differences that may exist. Um, I suspect Sadly, the, the picture is pretty true across schools across the UK. I don't think this is um, limited to Scotland. Um, I have been surprised to see the, the scale of it. To think that 64% of girls have experienced some form of sexual harassment is really heartbreaking. To think that in a place where they should feel safe and empowered and, and probably the place you should feel most safe, um, girls are experiencing things like unwanted touching, they're experiencing sexist comments sent to them over messenger, um, even just jokes in the, in the corridor. And just to read a little bit from one of the girls we've spoken to, I think this is one of the saddest lines. She said that following an incident, she was left feeling mortified. It was weird as a girl, you're expected to just put up with it. To admit it upset you reflected badly on you and not on the boys. So I think that speaks to the level that it's normalised and I guess that's an indication of how common it is as well. Yes. Catherine Dawson. Um, I, um, I suppose that the nature of our organisation's engagement with, um, with, with young people is through direct delivery in schools, so I don't have, you know, I would, I would sort of defer to other sources of statistical information. I wanted to make a point about how um, it's not just the individual incidence rates that are important, but also because it's so widespread, the climate of policing and control of young women's sexuality and sexual expression and bodies, um, and how in that climate it's very confining. Um, so whether or not somebody has experienced individually direct sexual harassment, it's about that kind of climate. And just to add to that, that that climate is happening via online technologies as well. And I think it's very important that our approach to online technologies isn't to see them as a completely separate thing, but to see how these same human behaviours are happening, these same dynamics of, um, of, of sort of gendered um, harassment are happening. Just as they are face to face, they're being facilitated by technology as well. Yes, Amy Jones. Um, yeah, from our perspective as well, all of our information is UK wide, but given what Catherine just said about sort of the culture, and these cultures can be unique to different places, I think it's very important that we drill down and look a little bit more about Scotland in specific. Um, yeah, I think um, a lot of the information we have is UK wide, and even that we know will be incredibly underreported. Rosanna McDonald? Nothing to add. Um, do you have anything you'd like to probe on that question, Emily? Because I do have a, a couple of supplementaries to it. No. No? Okay. Can I have our deputy convener and then Martha Barr? Uh, thank you, convener. Um, just kind of touching on what everybody's already spoken a little bit about, which is um, that a lot of this is happening with young girls. And there was a study con uh, conducted by Ofsted which stated that girls and boys tend to start... Um, kind of putting um, men and women into jobs by the age of about seven and eight. So, <clears throat> like, sorry, my throat's going. Um, so about the age of about seven or eight, that's when they start saying, you know, footballers have to be men or nurses have to be women. So do you think it's important that it's not just, these studies are just not um, done in like, lower high school ages, but also in primary schools, and maybe even so, even earlier than that? Uh, can, I, can I have someone to address that? that point. Amy Johnson. I mean, I agree completely. And um, just as an example of how it's done somewhere else in Sweden, they've had tackling gender inequality in the early years, so from two upwards in Sweden, in their national curriculum since 1998. So it's, you know, it can be done. Um, and I think acknowledging how young children, how young children um, interpret and absorb things that are around them and learn from a very young age whether what they are is less or more and also have to fit into a binary that requires a lot of them um, is really important to tackling this as a whole, for sure. And it fits into health and well-being, which is a priority for children of all ages. Okay, Martha Parr has a question. A question for Catherine Dawson. You um, said that the school climate can be um, difficult for women expressing their sexuality, and I just wanted to clarify what you meant by this. 
Yeah, I was, so I suppose I was speaking about sexuality distinct from sexual orientation, so just about being able to become sexual beings in, and having freedoms in the way that they do that and, and what that means to them, rather than that being getting very, very strong messages about what's okay and what's not okay. But I would certainly add to that 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 should include freedom around sexual orientation as well. Back to Emily Davis. Thank you, convener. Um, can um, the panel give examples of the activities that they have going on in schools to address sexual harassment and sexual behaviour in the contexts that they've mentioned? Catherine, back to you. <laughs> um, so I mentioned in my introduction that um, the, so we have a national sexual violence prevention programme and that has been operating since 2013. Um, it's been funded, um, it's current, so its main funding is through the Children, Young People and Families Early Intervention Fund from the Scottish Government. Um, that currently funds us to reach um, approximately 13,000 young people every year with up to three workshops from a range of workshop topics which include gender, consent, understanding what sexual violence is, social media, um, the impacts and how you can be supportive to people that are, are survivors of sexual violence, um, how we can all play a role in tackling sexual violence, and another one that I can't currently remember. Um, and each of those topics is adapted to four different age ranges. Um, so at the moment delivered, well it's delivered by prevention workers based at Rape Crisis Centre, so a real strength of it is that they're specialists, they're going into a series of schools and, and other youth settings and talking to young people about those issues. Um, and we're very pleased that through sort of in connection with the Equally Safe Implementation Plan, the Violence Against Women Fund has extended funding for that so that we will be able to soon work in all of the local authorities in Scotland. Um, it won't be enough to reach all the schools because of capacity issues. They're still part-time workers, but it will mean that there'll be a prevention worker with some coverage of each local authority area. Um, so that's that's the prevention programme. Do you want to speak about whole schools? Is that yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so the whole schools approach, which uh, Rape Crisis Scotland and Zero Tolerance do in partnership, centres young people um, and asks them through a series of steps to identify the priority issues within their school and then take steps and actions to um, respond to them. Um, but because it's a whole schools approach, it also works with young people to go through the entire curriculum and look at how that can be strengthened to support gender equality within the school. Um, and also the school's policies, uh, what else am I mind? Teacher training. Teacher training, yeah. yep. Um, so it kind of covers just about everything, but it's quite, it's a, it's a, would it be fair to say fairly resource-heavy-ish approach? Uh, yeah, I think it's, it's sort of the, the, the model kind of is, um, it includes a coordinator. I mean, it's a pilot at the moment, so we're really trying to see what works um, and how much, because I think from our experience working with schools in general is that you need somebody who's got that kind of expertise and knowledge specific to gender-based violence to be able to sort of support a school through each stage to work out what that means for them mm -hmm. um, and to help young people frame their own actions and priorities. Um, so the... Um, the coordinator's currently piloting in two schools, next year a further two, and in the final year it'll be four. Um, and I think throughout that whole process we'll be looking at well, what, what's possible in the future, taking this from a pilot to, and, and having discussions with the Scottish Government around that as well. And I think what I was trying to say but slightly badly there was that um, <laughs> having, having this coordinator role um, allows young people to be really centred, but it does mean that that person has to be an expert, um, has to be able to really know their stuff and be very expert with working with young people as well. Okay, now, both Katrina Carter and Erin Wembo have small supplementaries uh, to this, so if we could ask those before we bring in Rosanna and Mary. Katrina. Um, so you mentioned about teacher training, and so my question was more about the implementation of how much room there is in the current curriculum for this and the relevance of this on sort of wider Scottish government targets around the attainment gap. Do you think that it could be argued that closing the attainment gap could be done by improving this kind of education in schools and through teacher training? All right, I'll bring in Erin before we go to the panel. Um, I would like to ask Amy Johnson, you talked about the pilots um, and Catherine Dawson. Um, are these equally spread across Scotland? Are they focused in the central belt? And are they reaching out to rural communities and young women in the more remote parts of Scotland? 
Comments from the panel, then I'll go back to Emily. Amy Johnson. Um, I'll answer the first question first. Um, <laughs> absolutely. I think yeah. that's really important. I think as, as we move forward with um, when the PSC review and report comes out as well, I think working at how to articulate the link between gender equality, health and well-being and attainment is absolutely key to having this centred as it should be. Because how can young women and young people focus and study if they're scared or if they're tired or if they're facing mental health challenges because of their experiences in what should be a safe place. So absolutely, and I think it's a, um, a matter for the third sector and to try and work out how to articulate that as strongly as possible, because um, I think that's a really, really key point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I suppose just to add to that then, in terms of attainment, I think um, when we were researching for the whole schools, I read um, a very sort of convincing document which had pulled together some key issues about, you know, how do we think about attainment and, and bringing the issue of gender to attainment? And actually that there's a strong case to be made that if we want to tackle attainment in relation to boys, tackling gender inequality is, is a key way to do that. So yes, I would be concerned about that sort of um, attainment um, sort of the, the, the sort of priority given to that, that it's probably, I think probably it's fair to say it's largely gender, not, not a gendered approach, and that would strengthen it. Um, and then um, in relation to the spread of the pilots, at the moment, um, the first two are in Lanarkshire. Um, they are going, I mean, it's, as it's a pilot, it is going to be a small number of schools. It's not at this stage going to be, you know, the, the sort of the scaling up is the next stage question. Um, but because the work, because we're on a limited budget and because the worker is Glasgow based, then schools are going to be constrained by that um, sort of within one to two hours of Glasgow, which does, doesn't necessarily rule out rural areas, but it certainly does rule out for the pilot much further away areas. We did do some research for leading into it in Highland as well. Um, and so, yeah, I, I know that it's got limitations, unfortunately, in terms of, of how representative it's going to be as a pilot. Do, do Mary or Rosanna have anything they'd like to add to any of that? No? I'll move on to Martha Barr. Um, I was wondering what reasons any of you could give for the amount of sexual harassment and sexist behaviour that happens in schools, and uh, is it as commonplace as the research is suggesting? Mary Gordon. I think it's definitely an area where more research would be really valuable. Um, I think the reasons behind it are very complex, but I'd, I'd second what Catherine said about a cultural issue. Um, when, when sexist attitudes are so pervasive and when they start so early on in life, I think that explains a lot about the prevalence of, of sexual harassment um, and the sort of normalisation that we've seen in, in all areas of life, but sadly in schools as well. Um, we do have some further research about how early gender stereotypes start to affect girls' views of themselves and their views of how they should behave. So our recent survey found that for girls as young as seven, they start to change what they think, they start to change their willingness to uh, say what they think, to speak up in class, even how they behave around other girls, other boys, what they'll wear, what types of sports they'll play. So I think the roots are really early on and as much as the focus should be on uh, the recording of incidents and taking a zero tolerance approach and ensuring our schools are safe, we do also have to look at the wider cultural question and how we can start changing those attitudes, um, you know, when, when children are, are young. Mm -hmm. Rosanna MacDonald. Yeah, I would agree with everything Mary said. Um, and I'd also just add that in a time when relationships, sexual health and education, um, parenthood education, is, uh, RSHP, um, is not quite as um, adept as it could be in um, working with young people and talking to young people about issues of gender stereotypes and sex education. Um, young people are going to increasingly easy to access pornography, which is often uh, depicting violence against women. And there's a lot of research out there which shows that um, watching this and having access to this can impact on um, views about gender roles and norms and violence against women. So I think that is an area that does need attention um, in order to tackle it. Amy Johnson. 
follow on from that zero tolerance uh, conductor survey, and it's a bit old now, it's 2014, um, specifically on this, and views of pornography and how that um, impacts young people's perceptions of themselves and also how they are in school. So I can, I can definitely point that out for the clerks to, to have later on. Um, I'd say that sexual harassment is about power inequality. Um, and it does exist within this continuum, this broader continuum of violence against women and girls. Um, but within that, there's, there's a huge uh, array of nuances and other forms of power inequality that play into that. And I think when, um, especially when we're talking about it in schools, young people, young women and girls, and young men and boys um, have a lot of the answers and can speak to a lot of their experiences and then identify some of those nuances, something that came up through the whole school's approach was how um, homophobia and sexual harassment is often linked as a way to police gender norms and gender roles and to sort of reconfirm any, and transphobia, reconfirm binaries that then play into gender inequality. So I think, and that, that was articulated by young people, so I think trying to focus on their voices, as you are obviously doing, um, and hearing their perspectives is a really important way to continue to gather information. Um, I agree with everything, and I think I want to then add something about the stuff that is really difficult to tackle, which is that kind of the, um, a lot of the, the kind of messages coming around gender roles are, are sort of quite promoted by sex, music, and fashion industries who have, who have a profit invested in, um, in, in business models that sell. Um, and so I think that that's, that's very difficult. You know, the, the levers to try and tackle that are, are challenging for young people, for government, for everybody. But I still think it helps to keep it in view because um, those um, images are so powerful including images, sort of erotic images through pornography, um, images in music videos, and absolutely not to shame young people for, for wanting or being interested in those things, but if those images that are coming through are giving quite um, uh, confined ideas about how you should be, and then the peer group is kind of um, magnifying those pressures, um, I, th I think we do need to, to look at the, the, the power and the financial interests in um, pushing those ideas. Deputy Convener. Thank you, Convener. Um, so, I just a quick question for Mary Gordon, but open to all the panel as well. Um, you were mentioning there about um, how the, when it comes to the groups of girls, maybe aged around seven, you know, this is when they do begin, begin to change and begin to see themselves kind of more confined. Um, what we often see with a lot of schools is they bring in role models or they bring in kind of um, inspirational people that they can look up to. Do you think that this is something that is working um, or something that can make a difference? Does it change their perceptions? Um, yes, I do think it's a, it's a good place to start and Girl Guiding Scotland have run our own campaign a few years ago called Wow Women that was encouraging girls in our units uh, to think about what it means to be a role model, to think about what a leader looks like and to start identifying women in their life who inspire them. Um, so I do think role models have a hugely important role to, to play. It's, it's difficult to be what you can't see. Um, but I do think it's, uh, it's only one part of the puzzle. Um, and unfortunately, because there are limited role models in, in areas of politics and, and science, business, the media, I guess what we really want to get to a point is that women succeeding at those high levels will not be an anomaly where it will become you know, the new normal. That's definitely something that we're aiming to work towards. We, we launched a new campaign yesterday actually called Citizen Girl that's about taking the next step and saying to girls, okay, well now you can be the leaders of tomorrow. Here's how you use your voice. Here's how you engage with parliament, hopefully complementing the work you're doing already here. Um, so I do think role models have an important role to play for boys as well as girls. I, I think the more boys see girls, it, the more boys see women at these, these high-level positions, the more normal that becomes, the better it will be for everyone. Um, Mary, could you send us in some information about Citizen Girl, please, can. that we can, yes. can distribute to everyone? I'd like to bring in Mina Baird, and then we'll go back to Martha Byrne. Yeah, um, thank you, convener. Um, I wanted to ask a question following up from a point from Amy Johnson that any of you are, can, can respond. Um, I'd like to ask if you're, a, you were talking about different intersecting power inequalities, um, and I wanted to ask if you're aware of evidence that highlights the prevalence of sexual harassment among different minority groups. So um, in terms of where homophobia, racism, transphobia, and so on plays, plays a role in sexual harassment. Uh, 
Amy? Yes. Sorry, but I think not to force on you, Catherine, it might be really interesting to hear your perspective to yeah. continue your, <laughs> <laughs> your joint working, that's fine. Uh, um, I don't think there's enough research and I don't think there's enough evidence. Um, in terms of broader sexual harassment outside of school, there's research that's been done and I'm going to have to follow up with the names of who did it, unfortunately, but it's on street harassment and women of colour and how they experience that. And it goes specifically into um, the fact that racism is usually directly accompanied with the harassment, like the harassment itself is racist, or as soon as the harassment is the person tries to stop the sexual harassment, the woman tries to say, leave me alone, it's immediately followed up with racism. Um, and the experience, I think the reason it's so important to look at it, whether it's the intersection between all forms of discrimination um, and harassment, is that can be a barrier to people reporting and to people feeling safe. If, um, and even you know, to them recognizing it's harassment if there's no role models that they can see that reflects their identity. So. Um, yeah, I would pass on to Catherine in case it's something else that's come up more within the prevention yeah, stuff. I was, within. Yeah, I, was, I mean, I've, I had a few thoughts about it, and I don't know of any um, studies, I'm not saying there aren't any, but I don't know of any studies that look at sort of sexual harassment in a school environment and then think about how that's broken down across sort of intersecting characteristics. Um, certainly, we know from um, work that one of my colleagues has done, particularly with groups of black and minority ethnic young women, that those experiences of racism and sexism are, 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 and, and Islamophobia as well can be experienced as you know not separate, not not distinct, but expressed um, expressed as as um, sort of combined. Um, and I suppose, therefore, experience as an attack of, of several parts of a person's identity um, and, and a general sense of, of um, you know, inadequate or lack of response in their education setting that, that might validate or recognise or do anything about that. I'm thinking also of the Tell Mama report, which is about um, um, reports of... Um, Islamophobic racism and harassment. That's not specific to young people, but that found that particularly... Um, women who wore a hijab were at the greatest likelihood of facing Islamophobia, um, generally from white men. Um, so I think that's going to be the same for young women in a school setting as well. Um, and again, this is at university level, but there was a subset done of um, a university. Um, it was uh, the NUS, an NUS report that was done some years back and um, the LBT society did a, a sort of a data analysis and found that there was a sort of at least twice the same levels um, of, of cisgendered heterosexual women that LBT women were facing um, in terms of harassment. So absolutely clear that, that there's sort of increased um, levels of harassment. I'm not sure that we've got the kind of data that we would like to have on that. Uh, Martha Barr would like to come back with a, a quick point. I just have a question for Mary Gordon. Is there any work being done in partnership with um, Scout Scotland to educate uh, specifically young boys on sexual harassment? Because as a, a woman in Scout Scotland, um, it's a very male-dominated area. We don't have a partnership at the moment, but it is something we'd be um, interested in exploring. We do obviously work closely with them on offering a number of opportunities for our members. Um, so yes, it's definitely something we could look into. Thank you. Um, I, I think one of the things that's coming out, one of the themes is about the school environment. And that was certainly something that was looked at with the committee of the parliament when they did their study. So I know that Faria and Mina both have questions on that. So if we could take both questions and then the panel can answer them. Faria Said. Yep, thank you, convener. Um, does the panel think that the school environment is adequately supporting girls and young women by protecting them from sexual harassment? And um, also are pupils reporting incidences as they um, see or hear them? And if not, why is that? Mina Beard. Um, and I'd like to ask the panel um, in relation to that, what it is they think is preventing schools from being able to provide the safe environments that children and young people need to prevent sexual harassment or sexist behaviour from taking place. Mary Gordon was the first to look up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, yes, sorry, drawing a slight blank there. 
<laughs> but to go back, sorry, could you just repeat the first question? I just want to make sure I've got it right. Yeah, sure. Um, do you think that the school environment is adequately protecting um, young women and girls when they experience sexual harassment? And are they reporting it? If not, then why do you think that is? Um, yes, so I'd say at the moment, um, just going off of our figures and our anecdotal evidence, which is obviously limited, um, I would say schools probably could and should be doing a better job of creating safer environments. And I think reporting is a big issue. Uh, a lot of the feedback we had from girls was that they're very nervous around reporting, and that is because of the sort of normalization of the behavior. So if they report saying, oh, a guy yelled a sexist taunt at me in the corridor, or somebody pulled my bra strap, unfortunately, we're at a point where those kind of behaviours are seen as so normal and just a bit of banter that they feel that by reporting it either won't do any good or they themselves could then become a victim of, of more harassment because they'll be seen as somebody who, you know, runs the teacher, it will have a negative implication. Um, so I definitely think there needs to be more training, there needs to be better recording, and I think sadly it, it does come back to that wider cultural change as well, that these behaviours need to be seen as unacceptable so that girls do feel confident in reporting them. Um, we do have some good news. Uh, our recent survey found that 59% of girls do feel comfortable challenging sexual harassment in, when it happens in schools, so they do feel comfortable calling that out. Obviously, we'd want that to be 100% of girls, and I think really for the change we want, that needs to be 100% of boys as well who feel comfortable challenging that. Uh, Faria, I know you had another question as well about you know systems that perhaps should be put in place. And it may be an appropriate time to bring that in as well in the light of Mary's answer. Uh, yep, yeah, so um, kind of touching on what Catherine and Amy were talking about earlier as well, um, some ethnic minority children can't speak about sex or relationships in the home, um, particularly children from Muslim or other faith-based families, and they might also be afraid of victim blaming. So um, I just wanted to ask, is, is there a need for specific support for these groups of people? Um, it's not an area that we have specific research on, but um, yeah, the, the feedback we got from girls is there are lots of different reasons why it can be challenging to report and, and to talk openly about these issues, so definitely welcome greater support. Yeah, can I bring in uh, Rosanna MacDonald, and could you also, Rosanna, address uh, Mina's point um, about what are the barriers, what is it that's preventing uh, yeah, good absolutely. practice happening? I hopefully have an accurate enough note of the question, so I'll, I'll try and deal with them one by one. So in terms of whether the school environment is doing enough to protect um, children, young people or young women when experiencing sexual harassment, um, I would say, without being too hard on schools, because I think the intention is really there, but I think um, no, at the moment, um, there isn't enough protection in place. Um, when it comes to domestic abuse, and we know of instances where um, if the abuser is also in the school, um, sometimes it's led to the young woman being asked to leave the school because the school doesn't have sufficient protection processes in place for her. So this can often lead to the young woman feeling that she's the one who's been penalised for what has happened, uh, she's the one leaving. So um, I think there really needs to be more processes in place, um, perhaps through a gender-based violence policy in the school that addresses from primary prevention, early intervention, to support the whole spectrum of what is needed in schools. So I think that needs to be looked at. In terms of reporting, um, I think, well, we know that the majority of um, abuse goes unreported um, for a range of reasons, maybe the fear of being um, stigmatized or blamed, but also lack of recognition of, them experience, of what they're experiencing as being abuse. Um, and so I, I think we need to, we've got a lot to do in terms of reporting and making sure that those are accurate. And I think the, the stats that we do have um, don't always reflect lived experience. So for example, with domestic abuse, um, this is going off on a wee tangent, but it's just to give an example. Um, Police Scotland's stats on domestic abuse are about domestic abuse incidents um, rather than the whole pattern of controlling behavior. So it doesn't necessarily reflect accurately what's actually going on. Um, in terms of the question of preventing, I, th I think I would just echo what Mary had said. It's about awareness, it's about education, it's about knowing how to respond appropriately. I think a lot of um, 
staff maybe don't feel that they're equipped to um, respond appropriately to a disclosure and have a fear of doing further harm. So I think we really need to make sure that staff feel confident to um, respond appropriately and know that um, the right questions to ask and the right way to respond. Um, and then your question about um, young people who um, are from minority ethnic families, I think that's a really great point and I think I'm the same as Mary, I don't think we have that much information on it but I think that is something that is now on my radar so thank you for bringing that up, I think it's a really important point um, and I certainly know that um, for young people who have experienced domestic abuse in their families there's additional barriers to reporting because they feel that um, people don't understand their culture and um, have that stopped them from for example calling Childline um, so yeah Lots of work needed on that. Catherine. Um, I don't want to repeat anything that's been said, so I think to say there's a sort of a whole rate, in general, no, not enough being done um, to protect, otherwise we wouldn't, be, we wouldn't be having this discussion probably. Um, but I think, you know, I think it's important to recognise the huge constraints that there are on schools and teachers in terms of time and resources, and the fact that for the majority, I think there is the will to try, and the will to perhaps to name if they see what they what they see as inappropriate behaviour, to, 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 to say something about that. But I think that um, we also hear about some really concerning things about, you know, the, the, the blame or the responsibility being sort of transferred to the person who's experienced the behaviour. For example, I heard about an incident that some young people told us about where um, a boy had uh, touched a girl's leg in class, you know, without her consent. She had called him a rude word and she had been sent out of the classroom. So that kind of lack of, of a teacher thinking, what's actually happened here and what's the right way to respond? What are the power dynamics in this situation? So I think um, having very clear guidelines for being able to, to understand the behaviour that's being seen and to respond appropriately. Um, I don't think... I, I do... I have heard that a huge amount of what guidance staff time is taken up with is about safeguarding concerns particularly around social media so there's obviously a lot of a lot of time being put into these issues but I think perhaps it's there, there could have been prevention in place to stop certain abuses happening via social media beforehand um, and I think probably the um, the, the the guidance or the, the, the ways that they are handling these things could be strengthened um, I think that um, a, a point about sort of specific support for black and minority ethnic young women um, and perhaps other groups of young women with protected characteristics as well, um, I think that that's going to be patchy. You know, I know that um, a lot of our learning has come through um, the Young Sahelia Group in Edinburgh, which has been a fantastic forum for young women to be able to talk about and actually identify some of these issues that they're facing. Um, I think there needs to be strong messages that these discussions are valid and that these issues are happening to give a clear signal that it's okay to talk about them. Um, okay, thank you. Yeah, Eleanor has a quick point she'd like to make and then we'll move on to Katrina. Thank you, convener. Um, I just wanted to ask uh, specifically to Mary Gordon, but also for the rest of the panel for my second point, um, whether there was any evidence um, of a contrast between the reporting of actual physical violence against women and girls in schools and sexual harassment. Um, and as a second point, whether there was any framework or best practice that's currently in place for physical abuse in schools that could be adapted to create a sexual harassment policy. Mm. Mary. Thanks for your question. It's not an area where we have um, that in-depth research and I wouldn't be the best uh, place to speak to sort of best practice within schools. Um, I can say from what girls have told us, a lot of their experiences in sexual harassment are focused on, on verbal abuse, um, jokes, taunts, sexist media comments. Um, but we did see a significant percentage, around 20%, saying that they were experiencing things like unwanted touching and unwanted attention. And I think as well, a concern for us is if these aren't addressed at a school level, what happens later in life when they do start forming relationships? Um, so I think it's important that we see it as a continuum. Um, it may just start as a, a, a sexist joke, um, but what does that say about, uh, about girls' wider experiences and what they can expect in, in future relationships and in their future lives? Um, I don't have any examples of best practice um, around physical abuse and, and violence, I'm afraid. I don't know if anyone else on the panel can speak to that in more detail, though. Amy Johnson. I'm afraid I don't have statistics on the variants, but um, in terms of looking at school policies, 
there's usually very clear um, anti-bullying pol bullying policies that very much encompass um, physical assault and the sort of process involved there, the um, commitment to not victim blaming, the fact that it's usually articulated quite clearly to young people in the schools are all, you know, pretty minor best practices that could certainly be used when it comes to sexual harassment policy because there's no reason why that wouldn't flow over entirely, but when we do look at policy in schools, let alone practice, just the policy, it's a lot, it's a lot more opaque. I doubt it's communicated to young people very clearly. Um, so I think even just that would be, would be excellent. Okay. Um, Mina was asking about barriers, um, you know, and what is it that's preventing reporting? And that ties in, I know, with a question that Katrina Carter wanted to ask. So if you could put your point, Katrina. Uh, thank you. Um, so it does it does tie into the the question of what schools are doing. Um, so my question was about what steps schools should be taking to ensure that sexual harassment is not either allowed to happen or ignored or downplayed when it does happen. And it's what resources schools have to allow that. Mary Gordon. I'm happy See, to you keep up. making the mistake, Mary, I know, of I looking, looking round and I, need to start I catch writing. your eye. <laughs> um, so, in our campaign, we were calling for uh, first off, compulsory high quality sex education in every school in Scotland um, and to make sure that what uh, young people are being taught is relevant to their lives. So, are we talking about consent? Are we talking about online abuse? Are we talking about gender equality and healthy relationships? Um, We've also called for schools to take a zero tolerance approach and to be held accountable for recording instances of sexual harassment. We gave evidence to the Equalities and Human Rights Committee um, a few months ago when they were reviewing their national anti-bullying guidance and I'm really pleased to say that our research and our members' views were taken on board and the Scottish Government has committed to better recording. In terms of, of getting that into every school and, and really making that a practical change. I think it does start with the, the improved sex and relationships education and also just looking at the, the wider school culture um, and how safe young people feel in the corridors, how safe they feel going to teachers and discussing these issues. Um, so I think for me it comes from improved education and it's hard to sort of put a, a name to it but just an improved sense of openness and willingness to talk about these issues. Catherine? Um, I think, I mean, I suppose the, the whole school approach aims to, to take a sort of a multi-layered approach to do that so that um, there's the preemptive education that talks about gender equality and gender-based violence as a whole um, and gives people a framework for understanding where all these behaviours fit in and, and what the problems are and, and why, therefore, it's not just the case of a comment or a touch. So that's the kind of proactive education that also names these behaviours as well, so so shifts the kind of silence around them so that someone who is perpetrating such a behaviour is less able to kind of minimise it and, and perhaps hopefully less, li less likely to perpetrate it in the first place. Um, it also means that there's guidance for school staff. The teacher training in includes kind of interventions into everyday behaviours that they might see in, in the corridor, in the classroom, so that they are um, given a response and that that response says something about the nature of the behaviour. It doesn't just say don't do that, but names it as sexist. Um, and the downplaying as well, that would probably come in as well as those proactive things. It would come in at the stage when um, a, a concern had been raised, a disclosure had been made, so that the usually the guidance staff will know how to sort of fully honour that and honour that person's experience, trust, believe, respect and those things. Um, one thing I was thinking as well in relation to that idea of um, making it clear that they're not allowed, you know, certain behaviours aren't allowed, I do think that's really important. I also think it's really important that it's not just the case of um, adult tells child this isn't allowed. What I would really like is for our boys and young men to decide for themselves that they don't want this, that they don't want to do this. So then when they're in a different space, when they're in a private space, they don't even have the impulse to do it because they want to live in equality with this other human being. So as well as not allowed, not wanted. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I, I have to move on a bit. Fari, Fari, I was asking earlier about the, the need for systems to, to be put in place to allow... Um, confidential reporting um, and I know that our deputy convener wanted to ask a supplementary to that but I think I'll, I'll bring in Alexandra first because I know that Alexandra's interested in that theme and uh, about who are the most appropriate people 
for these systems to be run by? Alexandra. Um, my question for the panel is, which organisations have a responsibility for ensuring that the systems and sports are, in, are actually in place to allow girls and young women to actually report these issues and get support for them? Yes. We'll bring in uh, Nazia's supplementary as well at the moment. Okay. Um, thank you. So it was just in uh, relation to um, creating an environment that can be safe. There's been kind of talk about this idea of creating a um, uh, safe physical space within schools for those facing harassment and, and discrimination. Um, do you think that would be beneficial or do you think that could actually cause more scrutiny to those um, using those spaces if, you know, for example, more bullying and such? Aha. Amy Johnson. <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I think exactly how you described it could be problematic, but if you take a space that's already in existence and you declare it a, space, a safe place and you work with young people to ensure that bystander intervention is, is understood and people feel safe and confident to do it and with teachers to make sure that they're in the same boat. Because uh, just a quick um, stat from the National Education Union's 2017 report, uh, one in three teachers say they see sexual harassment on a weekly basis. So it's like, if you're seeing it, are you equipped? Are you empowered to stop it? I'm assuming for young people, it's much, much higher, that figure. Um, so yeah, I think a safe space, but that's supported with other initiatives is really important. And then in response to the first question, I think it's, it's first and foremost the school's responsibility, but they need to be supported by the entire education setting in Scotland. Catherine. Just, I think I would say the same as Amy in terms of that responsibility, you know, that state agencies have a, have a responsibility under the Equalities Act, but I also think that sort of third sector organisations have a, a responsibility to um, bring in their learning from working directly with victim survivors um, into that as well. Um, I'm not sure if I understood your question about the, safe, the safety issues and, and talking about safety for those who are more likely to face harassment and discrimination. Was there an issue there about sort of drawing attention to those people and making them feel singled out? So, for example, maybe for students who, um, if they were to go into the safe space and other students were to notice this, um, do you think that could cause um, an issue for that student, as in, you know, other children making fun of them or something, or you know, just things like that? Yeah, yeah. I think I think it's probably about how it's handled then, and, and maybe that safe space being general enough that it doesn't make people feel too singled out for going. Um, I suppose I was thinking about a wider issue as well, about when you're, when you're talking about these issues um, that certain groups, perhaps minority groups rather than women as a whole, um, that might, when, when we have those discussions, that those people might feel that the issue is sort of singling them out. So I suppose in that, then, then, then our messages really need to be more about the, the, the ways that um, discrimination works and, and, and the people who discriminate rather than focusing on those that face the discrimination. But in, in relation to the physical safe space, I think um, if, if people say that they want it and that they would value it, then it's about trying to discuss with them how that would work in a way that it actually felt safe rather than exposing. Yes. Um, I think we're, we're moving on to the last theme now um, that we wish to cover today. We tried very much to group things together in order we could have a good discussion. A uh, very important theme, though, and I would ask Mina to open that up. Yeah, um, thank you, Convener. I'd like to ask the panel um, what will they think about whether the law as it currently stands offers the right levers to ensure that incidences of sexual harassment in schools can be dealt with appropriately, and if not, what needs to change? I can see Maria staring at her desk. <laughs> Views on that? Rosanna McDonald. This might be slightly indirect, but it's definitely related, and I think it's an important thing to bring up. So um, recently, um, the Scottish Parliament passed the Domestic Abuse Bill, which um, is a really groundbreaking piece of legislation, and it... Um, basically more accurate, accurately reflects the lived experiences of women and children experiencing domestic abuse. Um, so I think that this will lead to raised awareness of what domestic abuse and other forms of gender-based violence and um, sexual harassment entail. Um, and I know that part of the follow-up of implementing that act is to have an awareness raising campaign. So I think that it's important that schools are targeted within that. Um, but 
certainly, I think that's all part of the, the general um, action to tackle gender-based violence through law. Um, yeah. <laughs> I could have waited. Well, why, why don't I bring in Anissa Dashgir first? Because it's a related question and it can be addressed together. Okay, thank you, convener. So my question for the panel is, are legal measures the most appropriate, appropriate way to tackle sexual harassment in schools? Um, so do we need more and is it most appropriate way? Um, I think my answer to the first question was going to be, I think, about, you know, that there are many, many of these forms of, of harassment and violence that we've talked about that are illegal, a lot of them underneath the, the Sexual Offences Act, and also the Abusive Behaviour and Sexual Harm Act, which is specifically about um, 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 sharing of images through technology. So a lot of that is, is relevant and it's there, but I think it probably isn't brought into alignment with the kinds of guidance that schools are using to... Um, to recognise the kinds of behaviours that they're seeing. So not only is there, do they know that the, the laws are there and are they clear about that, but also then what's their messaging to young people around what the law says. And then there's a set of issues as well about the kind of the stage of getting access to that justice, which throws up all those issues about, you know, do young people have the, the choice and the knowledge to be able to report when they want to? I think a lot of young people, and, and indeed adults as well, often don't report or feel worried about reporting because they don't know what's going to happen to their information and whether they're going to lose control of what happens. So, you know, hence that we have such a big gap between incidents and reporting. So I think... To summarise, the alignment of, of, of gui behavioural guidance at school and, and what legal protections there are, but also thinking about how young people can have real access if they want to to, um, to that. Um, and legal measures are, I think they're a, piece, a part of the puzzle. I think if we don't have um, a, within a school and within a society, if we don't have those kinds of robust measures of, you know, if you behave in this way, if you violate other people and if you disrespect other people's rights, you know, there need to be measures that a state or a school or an institution or a workplace will take about that. Um, and if those are more effective, then that sends a message which plays into prevention as well. So I would say part of the picture rather than being the, the most important part of it. Lisa, would you like to add to this discussion? Lisa yeah. Clark. Could I ask the panel um, what they think we need to change to ensure that teachers know how to properly report incidents um, in schools, uh, including to the police, where necessary? And I know that Martha also had a supplementary to the discussion going on. Just wanted to ask um, Rosanna MacDonald um, quickly to just clarify that was this the domestic abuse bill that had the new inclusions with the economic abuse as well in it? Yes. Thank you. Right, so we were looking at uh, what needs to change to ensure that teachers know how to report. Up on, on Lisa's point, I think teachers grew up in the same culture that the rest of us did, so the same attitudes, the same sexism, and the same sort of generalised acceptance of sexual harassment affects them as much as it affects young people. Um, I think a greater awareness of what constitutes sexual harassment, a greater awareness of what girls are experiencing at school and in their wider lives online um, would be really helpful so that they can recognise these incidents and feel confident to take action when they see them in the corridors and to take further action if, um, if necessary, including reporting to the police. Um, so yeah, I think un un for it, it's, it feels like a bit of a cop-out to say that we need to change the sort of broader understanding, but I do think that's essentially what needs to be done. Amy Johnson. Both those points. Um, I work with um, early years practitioners and with youth workers. Like the first step is asking them to reflect on uh, their own internal bias um, or prejudice that they've inherited or absorbed. Um, and that's hard to do without, you know, to do in a blame-free setting. But it's really important to do in a blame-free setting. Um, so, you know that. <laughs> and then. Um, can you remind me of your second point? Sorry, I'm going. It's a question. Can I still remember it? Um, oh dear. <laughs> um, um, yeah, I think just talking about the importance of, of teachers being able to recognise sexual harassment, understand what that term means, understands it. It doesn't. It may not be what they think. It may just be a, a joke. Um, 
or a comment in the school corridor, but being able to recognise it at that level, I think, and call it out really at its root would be very valuable. So the only other thing I'd add then is um, within the whole school approach, one thing that we do encourage as part of the teacher training is for young people to deliver certain sessions of the training. And um, as the pilot continues, we'll develop on that. But especially when it's online, about online abuse or harassment, having the young people's perspectives fed directly into what the teachers understand and know is key. Kathleen. Um, I remember my second point and I forgot my first one, but I was thinking about this idea of there being a proportionate response. You know, not all forms of violence will necessarily, um, even if they do register as, a, as, as being a crime, it might not necessarily be the right thing um, to report. Whether or not it's the right thing, I think, starts with the person who experienced it and what their views are on that and whether they, they would want it to be reported. Um, so I think if a, if a school's going to take forward a report, that needs to be delicately done with consideration for what the young person wants. Um, child protection procedures are going to come into play as well, so it might be that they are discussing it in partnership with social work or the police. Um, so I think that it, it very much depends on what's happened, but it's important to be in discussion with the young person about that. You know, if, if something was reported without a young person wishing it to, and if the police decided it was in the public interest to, um, to investigate and potentially bring to trial, that young person's then a witness when they haven't necessarily wanted to be it. So in the same way we were with adults, it's very important that a person has due um, choice, you know, as far as is appropriate, um, given child protection concerns as to whether or not they want to report. Um, and the other thing I was thinking as well is that, um, so not all forms, not, not all forms of violence that are perpetrated um, are, might be the, the police response might not be the most appropriate thing. But I think we need. Um, clear measures in place for those who, who are starting to perpetrate things, um, sexually harassing comments, maybe certain forms of online abuses, things where it wouldn't necessarily be something you would want to see a full, a full police investigation of, but is there some kind of s disciplinary educational response for people who are using those behaviours? Um, it always seems to come back round to reporting as well. And I know that Fari has got a particular interest in reporting. If you would like to go back to your um, original question about that, Fari. Okay, thank you, Convener. Um, yeah, is there a need for a national helpline to be put in place that would allow young women to um, safely and anonymously report incidents of sexual harassment that happen? Uh, can I ask for fairly quick responses in that, please? My eyes on the clock. Catherine? Yeah. Just, I'll uh, just go along. Catherine? I don't know. I haven't given it due consideration. I think what we need to think about is um, what would that enable them to do that they're not already able to do? Um, what would their expectations be? So, for example, if, if you were to anonymously report, yes, you've then been able to have your incident counted, recognised, validated, but it wouldn't be able to go any further than that. Um, if it's a case of being able to contact somebody to discuss that experience, um, there are certainly the, the Rape Crisis Scotland helplines available there for anybody aged 13 upwards of any gender. So that would be a space that, that they, they would be able to discuss their experience and get support. So I think it would be about clarifying the purpose. Amy, a quick response, please. I don't, I don't have anything to add to that. Well, that was quick. <laughs> <laughs> Rosanna. I, I, yeah, I think I agree with Catherine. Um, and I think we know that from the so SWA runs the domestic abuse and forced marriage helpline and we know we get very few calls from younger women so um, if there was a helpline around this I think they would need to be doing a lot of work of what we've been talking about already about awareness raising of um, what that um, behaviour entails and yeah as Catherine says um, what would be the outcome for the person who's reporting it what would help them in that situation. Mary. Yeah, just to second what Rosanna said, I think it's a, an interesting idea and I, I do think there's an issue where young, younger women are maybe less aware of the support that's available in the various helplines, so perhaps it's also about how do we make sure there's awareness of what already exists um, and how do we connect that with young women. Right. Thank you everyone. I am going to give our Deputy Convener one minute to give us her views on, on what we've heard today. Thank you, Convener. Um, I think it's fantastic to know that there's so much being done in regards to research, um, fighting this harassment and just challenging these norms, but also that as a table here, we've now been able to constructively agree that further research and action uh, is required to, ch um, to change these norms and these perceptions. Um, but that means not only for young people, it also means for teachers, for adults, for schools themselves and even organisations. So it's not just about us um, tackling this within schools, but also within everything that's associated with the schools. 
So, um, yeah, it's, um, I think that we've got quite a lot out of today for that. Under a minute. <laughs> yeah, and I have miscalculated, so I'm going to speak very slowly. <laughs> I would like, on behalf of everyone here, to thank the panel very, very much for coming along. I think everyone would agree that we heard some really interesting evidence from you and uh, a lot of food for thought. Um, so I know that there's going to be a lot of discussion in the private session. So, what I will do is... <laughs> no, that concludes our evidence session for today. So again, thank you to our panel. And I close this session and we now move into private session. Thank you very much. <laughs>